Yes. Yesterday, I feel like we did a whole bunch of diving into the 3.0 framework and the great work a lot of our squads are doing around data exchange. Um, today, I feel like we're shifting uh, more to the art, art part of our science um, uh, that happens in our community. So yesterday, you know, we heard Grace taking us through the 3.0 framework and, and really looking at the new technologies we're moving to that will help us unlock collaboration. Um, but that collaboration doesn't happen magically. It takes motivation, it takes planning, it takes coordination. Um, it needs a supportive environment and the right, you know, the right tools to grow. So it's it's goes beyond the tech, um, having technologies that help us collaborate. So what we're going to do in the next 35 minutes is take a look at um, how we are answering the question around unlocking and making collaboration happen across multiple country governments and organizations. Um, you know, how do we really make this collaboration meaningful and help implementers um, work together on shared problems while meeting their deliverables. Um, this is not always an easy thing. Um, I just want to start off by saying, too, you know, there are five things that I've heard a lot over the last two or three years about the open MRS community. Things like, who's making the decisions around here? The community isn't building anything. There aren't any senior developers to answer questions. Our resources are extremely limit, limited. Um, the community takes too long and I need a solution for this this quarter. Um, so I hope that through some of the showcases yesterday and even from um, the, the brief presentation Christine did this morning about um, our rising stars and fellowships that some of these questions are starting to be answered and I hope that, uh, that some of these will start also to be answered in, in, to, in today's presentations and this one as well. So let's, let's look at where we were, um, just like we did with a 3.0 framework. You know, where, where have we been? And I really like this quote around autonomy and alignment. Great alignment with little autonomy will curtail your team's innovation and agility to get stuff done. Too little alignment will result in teams working far too independently and you'll lose insight and coordination required to meet business goals. So in the past, our community has used a, a simple community structure that really provided great alignment. It worked well when we were small, but not so well as OpenMRS implementations expanded and really began focusing on meeting those urgent calls for custom front-end features. So our technology and our environment in a way limited our ability to innovate and get stuff done together. And those active in the community became more and more focused on simply maintaining our platform and ref app. Meanwhile, um, implementers have been striving to deliver custom front-end features. So you can see that the focus of these two groups has kind of been in different areas, but because the alignment has been shrinking, um, it's been really difficult for us to meet country priorities and implementer priorities together, or even share that front end code and other inter artifacts that can be reused and improved. Well, the good thing is that not only is our technology changing, our community has been adapting and changing along the way. You know, we know that more organizations are developing and implementing OpenMRS than ever before. Our values remain the same. We still value being community driven, user centered, open and transparent because we know that that works. The question has been, how do we accommodate this growth and create an environment where we can collaborate and solve problems together? So over the last couple of years, um, we've been making changes to our community to accommodate this growth, create new opportunities for collaboration, for leadership. Um, while remaining true to the values that we know work, right? So what we're trying to do with our new updated community model is, fig is balancing alignment and autonomy and get, trying to get to the right level so that individuals and organizations working in the community together are empowered and inspired to innovate and collaborate to meet 
both our community goals and, and their own organizational goals. So what does our updated community model look like? How do we balance autonomy with goal alliance? So we now are working with multiple squads and teams with engaged, deliberate implementer and community support. So each squad or team works together to solve a particular problem and keep, and keep collaboration happening in a coordinated way. So just to, just to kind of answer the question, what's the difference between a squad and our team? Why are we using these two different words? So squads are small groups of implementers working on specific discrete solutions to a shared problem with community support. And the, community, the committees and teams are really implementers and, and a, a few key roles supported by OpenMRS Inc. working together to form and support squads and assure that alignment across, across our community. Um, so, so you can see from this diagram, we have about six, right now we've got about six squads and we've got about six, six teams. And we're gonna go into an actual like example case study of how this actually works in just a few minutes. Um, but I want to kind of focus a little bit more on some of the squads because as we've worked through and started you know, building these squads, we've noticed a few, a few important things about this. Um, so we know that, uh, that squads that are successful, one, have two or three implementations who are actively engaged on an ongoing basis in what the squads are doing. And I'll say more about that in, when we get to our case study. Um, and then they also have the right balance of roles. Even if, even if somebody is wearing a couple of different hats, um, you know, you can see these, these roles here. We usually have a product owner, a product manager. Um, we're trying hard to identify people who can be um, technical architects or stewards across multiple squads and for a particular squad. Uh, we have you know, developers, uh, can't, can't really produce something in a technical squad without developers. Um, we're seeing UX designers become a, an important part of some of our squads. We are seeing QA engineers and testers um, starting to, to kind of pop up and, and in a, as roles in our squads. Um, and then hopefully in the future, we'll see more technical writers. And um, as you may have gathered, um, some of our squads also have fellows on there to kind of keep expanding and growing our community's talent. So I wanna draw your attention to the diagram here, right? It might look familiar, and if it doesn't, I'm just gonna show the 3.0 framework overview that Grace shared yesterday. And I hope you can see here that, that the way, when you look at our different squads, you'll notice that they all kind of, each one kind of tackles a different part of our 3.0 framework. So already our 3.0 framework, our th this, this whole idea gives us a framework to coordinate across squads um, and, and make sure that, that some of that alignment is happening in terms of where we're going together in our community. But just having it lined up like this is not, is not quite enough. So what about, um, what about committees and teams? How do we, how do we kind of make sure that communication is happening across squads um, in, in a way that doesn't necessarily rely on random water cooler discussions among squad members, um, trying to kind of find out what's going on on another squad so that they know whether or not their solution aligns with it. Um, so we have uh, our technical action committee and a few key teams that, that are there to really provide vision and coordination um, ac across the different squads. And, squads. Um, and, and this is where we have a few key cross-cutting support roles. Um, like I mentioned, we, we, we're trying to have a technical leader steward kind of oversee a few different squads that are working on related problems. Um, we have Grace as director of product, myself as director of community. We have development leads and mentors like Daniel um, to, to help us move forward. We have up and coming leaders like Ian who also help 
provide some connection across different squads. Um, we have Kuis as our QA engineer and mentor and Christine as our QA lead. And all of us together really provide support to the different squads and to the teams to really help us bring everything together while letting squads retain their own autonomy. Right, so, so we're kind of that, we're, we're overarching and cutting across the different squads, accessible to the different squads. So let's look a little bit more about what it means for a squad or a team to be autonomous. Um, like I said, successful squads um, have two, we know have two or three different implementers involved, actively involved in the squad. Um, but what we're really trying to do is make sure that um, squads are grounded, what the work that the squads are doing is, are, is grounded in the priorities of implementers on the squads. So that means also that the timelines and deliverables of the squad are determined by the implementers on the squad. Um, and, and when you have those two elements, plus squad roles being filled by a balance of implementers and community support, this really allows the squad to move forward at, at a fairly consistent um, pace and meet deliverables in the timelines needed, right? So that's where, you know, we kind of let squads have their autonomy and, and figure out how they want to work um, with, you know, with some guiding conventions. But how do we make sure that this actually aligns at, at, a at, the, at the bigger level, right? At the, at the higher level. So what we're also trying to do is link squad priorities not only to implement our priorities, but to our community's direction and to country goals. Um, you know, if you've, if you've heard um, some of the showcases, you'll see that we usually try to, to highlight what the country um, level priorities are, what the community's direction is and where the squads are going. Um, and then the collaboration, of course, is guided by not only our shared values, but also certain conventions. And our conventions in a way are our tools for collaboration. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that before um, later on. And then of course, you know, we need to have some way of bringing people onto the squads in a way that doesn't disrupt the squads, but gives people a, a, a way, a path um, to get started. So we have some community onboarding guides, academies and, and all of that that you'll hear more about today. So enough like, talking theory, let's look at an actual case study and see how this work, this has been actually working in real life. Um, so yesterday, many of you might've seen the dictionary manager show, um, showcase during the data exchange showcase. Um, if, if you're not, if you're wondering what is the data manager, manager web app, this used to be um, the OCL for OpenMRS web app. So this is a front end UI web app it leverages the OCL database and API. It helps manage concepts more easily. And it was built by implementers in collaboration with the OpenMRS community. But how did that squad develop the web app, ensure quality, how do they maintain it? And how have they been building capacity um, to expand the web app and maintain it? Well, first of all, we said, Squads are grounded in implementer priorities and each squad is now on their wiki page, you'll see they, they have the grounding priorities listed up there by implementer. Um, and those grounding priorities tend to link to the squad sprints and releases. Not, you know, not only that, you can see here for the data manager squad, we've had key people from our implementers, Ellen, Mark, Michael, Mahima from PIH and MSF respectively, you know, they came to the squad meetings and they are actively involved, sharing their priorities, helping ensure that, the, that what the squad is, is doing during sprints and what they're releasing actually meets their needs. So, so that's how we make sure that the that implementer priorities are reflected on the squads. We are seeing that um, there's, there's emerging engagement with both UCSF and Kenya EMR implementers. So you see here that, that we're adding to those priorities. So these aren't static, these can be dynamic. 
when a new implementer comes to a squad, we hope to hear what the priorities are so that can, it can be driven forward. So here's how, um, here's a quick and dirty place, um, our collaboration opportunities dashboard where you can see how, how the dictionary manager squad priority, building a dictionary once and then being able to reuse it across any implementation and share it with any organization, how that links to our community's product direction around data exchange, and then how that links to country priorities like efficiently creating and governing a centralized concept dictionary to support priority interoperability use cases and supporting the continuum of care across borders. So this is the space where we try to make sure, like call out that alignment. But let's go back to the squad. I mentioned that squad roles are filled by a balance of implementer and community support. And here you see everybody who has been actively engaged in the OpenMRS Dictionary Manager Squad um, through, I wanna say, April. So this is a little bit out of date, because like I said, there are people who are coming on to the, to the squad and, and joining it. Um, but you'll see, you know, if we dive a little bit deeper into the squad, you'll see that we have certain community-based resources providing essential support. So you have Grace and myself, we have Saruchi, who is our fantastic, um, PM and develop, development fellow um, providing product management. We have Hadija and Irene and Juliet, um, community developers. And you know, Hadija and Juliet are also fellows, mentors and fellows. So they're, they're kind of building the um, capacity of the squad in this area. And, and this, these people, we are all you know, a part of the squad. We consider ourselves squad members. Um, but what about the rest of the, the group, right? So here's where I say we have organizations filling critical squad roles. We I already mentioned Ellen and Michael and Mahima and Lara from, from MSF, you know, Ellen from PIH, you know, who, who have served as product owners. And then we have Burke and Ian and Mark um, who have been wearing that really important role of, you know, senior developer, technical architect, providing guidance to the team. Um, and we've even had subject matter experts and advisors like Andy and John Payne from OCL who have been providing their expertise and guidance to the squad. Um, and, and I think we've, you know, we, the squad had very deliberate conversations about the roles that the squad needed um, to fill. And when there was a gap, the squad had conversations about that. and and when it became clear, for instance, that we needed somebody to fill the role of product manager on a temporary basis, organizations stepped up and figured out how to, how to do that, um, even if it was a temporary need and, and bridge, to bridge a gap. And I think that in, in many ways um, enabled the squad to, to continue their momentum at a time um, when, when we were kind of wondering what would happen, but now it, we've bridged that gap. We came together. We met that challenge, um, and we're seeing, you know, we're seeing more and more come out of that squad. It's actually been a fantastic evolution to watch. Um, but there's, there's, this is not a static squad. There are still room for um, product managers or developers or UX designers to join this squad. So. If you, if you are interested in what the Dictionary Manager Squad is doing and you want to take up a role, there are, there are opportunities to do that. Don't be shy. But what about the support from cross-cutting teams, right? So I mentioned some of the community-specific squad um, support, but let's, let's kind of talk about those teams that I mentioned, um, like the Quality Assur Assurance Team. So you see here, we have you know, some of some very familiar faces. Um, the OpenMRS Dictionary Manager squad, squad, when they started thinking about testing and QA for their MVP release, um, they started connecting with the QA support team. They reached out to Kuis and Christine, um, our, our QA ment engineering mentor and our QA support lead. Um, and, and then they started actually going to the QA support team meetings to find out exactly what they were doing in terms of QA. What were the processes? What were the tools being used? 
Um, and, and this collaboration between the Dictionary Manager Squad and the QA um, support team has meant that the that people on the Dictionary Manager Squad, like Juliet and Hadija, are actively taking up the Q and learning about the QA automated frameworks and tools and processes that the QA support team has been working with. And, and they're integrating that, that QA into their squad's development cycle. So I hope Christine is smiling because whenever I say this, I think of what Christine says, QA starts at the beginning, not at the end. And this is really kind of making, starting to make that happen. What about the technical action committee? What happens when these two meet? So again, you see kind of a lot of the fam familiar faces, but on the technical action committee, that's really the group that we have, you know, that's where a lot of our technical leaders um, convene. And, and they, you know, it's their, their role to kind of provide overall vision and guidance to the squads. Um, and, and you'll see, you'll notice that some people who are on the dictionary manager squad happen to be on the technical action committee. So in that way, there's, there's an opportunity for that bi-directional communication to flow. And those people can help kind of bring up things from the dictionary squad, manager squad to the technical action committee for discussion if needed and vice versa. So this really, this, this is kind of how those two um, entities function. And this is where, you know, hopefully the role of a steward um, can kind of both sit on the technical action committee and on a few, few related squads and provide that kind of stewardship for, for our community. Um, a quick note about fellowships. I won't say much about this because um, Christine already went over it. We, you know, like I mentioned, we do have a couple of fellows and a fellow mentor on um, the Dictionary Manager Squad. So the community manages and supports the fellowships as a whole. Um, and those fellowships, you know, are really designed to connect experienced product managers like Grace um, and development mentors like Hadija with fellows who um, have great promise in, in either product management or development. And they all work together on the, on the Dictionary Manager Squad to both meet the, meet the squad's goals, but also give the, the fellows a, a, ground, a learning experience that is grounded in real life needs, um, which is much more engaging when, when you're working on, a, on an actual project that somebody's going to use, as we all know, than if you're, you're doing a fictional, um, a fictional reading or something. What about tools? Um, because we can bring everybody together, but if everybody's using totally different tools and um, conventions, things get things can get a little bit ugly. So while we give squads the autonomy to determine how they want to work together, you know, from how they make decisions to when and where they meet, the technical approaches they take, we do still need to have some conventions in place and shared tools in place to ensure that people can work across squads and assure um, quality. So this means um, using shared conventions and tools that you can find in our community code of conduct, our decision-making plays, our communication conventions, which will tell you what goes on the wiki. How do you use talk? When do you use Slack? Um, we also have project management tools and infrastructure like JIRA and GitHub that we use. Um, the OpenMRS style guide provides our conventions for the UX framework. And we have coding conventions, um, which include things like, what should you do during a code review? Um, so all of these, are, these conventions are tools that enable collaboration to happen. So that is, that is our case study. That, those, that's kind of how we've set up the environment and the, the tools to help collaboration happen, but what happens now? What if you're in an organization and you decide that you want to collaborate with a squad or a team? There are a lot, you know, there are six different squads, five or six different teams that you could get involved with. What questions should you be asking to really help you get involved meaningfully? 
And I think there are three to start out with. Why, why do you want to get involved? How do you want to get involved? And, and how do you want to get involved? So I want to, I want to start off with why. Um, and I really want to hear from people he, um, on the, in the audience. Uh, when you're starting out, why, why would organizations or why would you engage with the community? So I'm going to share a link to a, to the Ment a Mentimeter poll, and I'm going to share, share my screen so that you can see the Mentimeter. And this is a ranked question. Um, it's a ranked question, and the sorry, there we go. Um, ranked question. So all you have to do is look at the options and say which ones, um, which what, what is the most important reason for engaging with the community? Just first of all, engaging. not behaving. Okay. So I think some of you might have already been um, going, yep. Yeah. People, you're in there, you're ranking them. Why do organizations even start thinking about engaging with the community? I see saving time and avoiding duplication of effort is in first. So far, using existing resources effectively is coming up second, solving problems. Oh, might be edging up. Um, sharing knowledge and shared priorities are in fourth and fifth. You know, why do organizations even just consider engaging with the community. I'll just give, I'll give everybody maybe 30 more seconds and we'll see, um, see what comes out at the top. What is going to be the biggest reason for organizations engaging with the community? Seeing a few more votes for solving problems and sharing knowledge. Saving time and avoiding duplication of efforts and using resources effectively are neck and neck. Which one is going to cross the finish line? Okay, 10 more seconds, 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. All right, saving time and avoiding duplication of efforts has it, followed by using existing resources effectively solving problems, sharing knowledge, and shared priorities coming in third, fourth, and fifth. Now, I do have another question. It's very similar, but it's different at the same time. You know, you can start off with engaging with the community, but why do organizations make the decision to continue engaging with the community and actually contribute? So it's the same code, but different choices. Why would organizations continue to contribute to the community over the long term? Is it because there's mission and strategic goal alignment? Do they want to retain talent? Is it about innovation or keeping abreast with new tech? What is going to drive long term contributions? I see three people in, in here, five people are coming in. We're gonna give, the, give this a minute 
So you have a minute to, to rank your choices. Just go to www.menti.com and use the code 9001-4329 or the link in the chat. See 11 people, 13 people, 14, 15, 16. Eighteen twenty. I think we have another thirty seconds to go. What's going to continue to drive contributions to the community? Okay, we have about ten more seconds to go. So if you haven't ranked. Your choices, now's your chance. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, so the main thing that drives long-term contributions is mission and strategic goal alliance, followed alignment followed by keeping abreast with new tech, innovation, and retaining talent. Awesome. And I think that's I think that's very I, I hear that quite often. This all of this aligns with um, what you see, not only in the open MRS community, but with many open source projects. Um, what people are looking for in the short term and in the long term. So, once you know the why, it's kind of like what can you do, and how can you do? And you know, people can look. You can look at this from a, a couple of different perspectives. Um, one of them is very tangible. What are exactly the things that you can do in a squad and how can you do that, right? So there are things like gathering, helping a squad gather and share requirements, guiding the overall technical vision and approaches, planning and leading sprints, developing features and functionality, setting up. These are all very tangible things that squads are doing all the time um, that people can help do by taking on different roles in a squad from product owner to QA engineer to UX designer. Um, and, and those are very tangible things. But I think an important question is, even if you figure out what's motiv you, mo motivating you to, or to engage with the community and think about contributing long-term to a squad, what you might do and how, is how do you get started? Um, so if your organization wants to engage and contribute to the community, how do you really get started? And I think it's helpful to you know, think of this as a runway a little bit, and you'll hear a little bit about this runway later on, too, in a different context. Um, you know, think about what squads have shared priorities and goals, that what, where's, where's the mission alignment, or even what are, where are the deliverable alignments, right? And then figure out, well, what can you share? What are you already ready to share? Um, and then what work can you coordinate and what work can you collaborate on? None of this really happens overnight. Um, and every organization is a little bit different and has a little bit of a different starting point. But these are some, some questions to, to think about. And, and even as you think about what can you share, what can you coordinate, what can you collaborate on, um, it's also important for organizations to kind of reflect on what makes it hard to share what makes it hard to collaborate? What makes it hard to coordinate? And then what would make it easier to share um, and coordinate and collaborate? What changes might need to happen in order to make it easier to share and collaborate and coordinate? Um, and these can be things like um, including collaborative activities in your proposals, work plans, budgets. Maybe timelines don't align right now, but maybe next year you can kind of figure out a way for, to make those timelines um, align. Um, but in the short term, maybe it's joining and following along those conversations, those squads that align with your interests, sharing use cases. Um, maybe you have some flexibility and can assign someone from your team to, act, to play a more active role in a squad. Um, maybe you can start using community tools and conventions, either in a squad or you know, in your own organization. So these are just a few ideas of, of ways that you can start um, thinking about engaging more meaningfully with the community um, and kind of go, getting on that flight path um, from discovery 
to sharing, to coordinating, to collaborating. Um, and if you're wondering, you know, what are all the different squads and teams currently working on? This is kind of a quick synopsis of it. Um, it's, it's also available on our wiki. Um, I'll share a few links so that you can find out more. And of course, you've seen many of these squads and teams doing um, showcases this meeting, and you'll see a few, a few more today. So stay tuned for everything.